Yes, but there's a there's a childlike wonderment in a man that's still there that hasn't been you know destroyed. that's a quarter of a man because half a boy is therefore a quarter of a man. Half a boy is a quarter of a man. Yes, this is uh this is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's math, everyone, uh, <laughs> and it work it works out quite well. Cinematic fantastic. Atul, Barada, Nikto. I'll show you who I am and what I am. By a werewolf and lives, becomes a werewolf himself. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Hello and welcome to the Cinematic Fantastic Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Weatherford. And your other host, William Weatherford. Get ready for opinions, dad jokes, and bad jokes. As we watch and review sci-fi and fantasy films from the classics of yesteryear to the new favorites of today. Greetings, listeners. This is the fifth episode of Cinematic Fantastic. We are back with another silent film. We're almost out of the silent film period that we have chosen to talk about. This one is the ni- is that ni- 1925? 1925. 1925 movie, The Lost World, based upon Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's novel, The Lost World. I believe it came out sometime in the early 1900s. Am I right? I <laughs> I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Honestly, we, we, we can figure that out You know, when we talk about the plot later. Uh, yeah, this, this movie, it's our first with a kind of prehistoric monster in it. And... Uh, it's not going to be the last, as we as we said the last episode. The creatures that are in this are, are dinosaurs of a prehistoric variety. This movie is also groundbreaking because of its use of stop motion special effects and miniatures and miniatures. Very first of its kind that is a feature length. Feature length, right? Which uh. For most people who don't know, is like an hour and a half, two hours. Yes. Though it's probably like two hours, but it's like weighing down a little bit occasionally. I don't know. Like some are just like an hour and a half and some are two hours long. Some are even crazy enough to be like the Lord of the Rings extended editions. Uh, but you don't get those often. So uh, this movie is based off of a novel by uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So he was uh, born in 1860 uh, of May 22nd and he was throughout the era. He's commonly known for Sherlock Holmes, although, according to him, uh, his favorite character was not, in fact, Sherlock Holmes, but was Challenger, Professor Challenger, of this book, uh, which is really interesting. Another thing to mention is that this is actually a series. There's another one called, I think it's called something like Poison Fog, and there's one called Disintegration Machine. So there are other adventures featuring Challenger. And the interesting thing about Challenger, and we'll talk about this, Sherlock Holmes might be a little bit, you know, not gifted socially. You might say he's a little bit awkward. Um, he's a very gifted detective. But I think that Challenger comes off the opposite. He's very boisterous and kind of jerky, especially... He lives up to his name. He challenges... Oh, all you're right. ...about him. He challenges whoever comes across his way. Right, absolutely. And he's, he's very... He's kind of a barrel-chested kind of guy. Very intimidating. You know, a big head, even, it mentions. He's got a mad temper, quick temper... <laughs> He does have a mad temper, and we do see that in this film uh, by Wallace Beery. Of course, we'll go into the the actors at that time. The main thing that is the takeaway, and I, w- I say there's two things to take away from this movie. Um, and and first off, just to let you know, it's restored. Uh, it had some scenes that were restored. It's now it's on YouTube because it is public domain. You can also get it on Amazon with a much higher quality, but the YouTube quality is quite good. Yeah. However, if you are going to watch this movie, one thing is in its portrayal of dinosaurs which are honestly very amazing. It uh, features dinosaurs living like dinosaurs eating uh, other dinosaurs. So if you're uncomfortable with portrayals of eating of dinosaurs, then uh, probably don't watch this movie, but it kind of depends on your taste. It doesn't show extreme detail, but you do know that, you know, I mean, it doesn't show him, like, picking pieces off of the other dinosaur. I think that we may, these warnings that you're giving about the dinosaurs... Uh, eating other dinosaurs. Uh, if you think that's pretty bad, just wait until we get to the Jurassic Park series. I mean, those those have full-on dinosaurs eating people, so it's pretty pretty rough. Well, I mean, some guys almost get stomped to death in this, don't they? 
at the end, toward the end of the movie. Uh, yeah. They narrowly, narrowly escape having that uh, happen to them. And some people get, I guess, tripped up by the dinosaur. So there's some, there's some dinosaur on human action. Now, one thing that we can mention about this movie is that the, gr- the special effects are groundbreaking. Indeed. This was the CGI of its day. One thing that I can mention, it was one of the first to use uh, a split screen technique, which allows you to what, do what's called compositing, which is, well, the com- you did see some of the, some of those early efforts in in a trip to the moon, you know, the interesting special effects, you know, kind of experimentation that Mel S was doing. He was doing some compositing, but this kind of takes the cake with it. I think Mel S would have loved to see this. Yeah, they merged the stop motion dinosaurs with the humans in one scene, which is like pretty cool. Although they're like separated by a little bit in most shots. Yeah, you can tell they're doing it because of how it looks. Like there's some shots where like you can see the dinosaur and then you can see the humans and they're so tiny that you can see like their massive scale. It's just like incredible. These ginormous beasts living among the prehistoric ages. Right, especially if you look at it with the eyes of of people back then. You know, some of the test footage was shown, I think either by the director or Willis O'Brien, the uh, special special effects guy. They showed them to Harry Houdini, the famous magician, and they didn't tell him anything. They just said, "Mm, check out this movie we did. And he's just like, this is uh, is fantastic. He loved it. And of course, interestingly enough, when they released the film, they did not say stop motion special effects by Willis O'Brien. No, they said that he was a technical advisor. <laughs> so people Which was were not very much credit. No, no, no. But but wait a minute. They did that on purpose so that people would go. How did they do that? Nowadays they have making of. They have deleted scenes. They have you know behind the scenes. They have you know CGI tests. You know we can kind of find out how they did it and we can explore that and go. Oh wow, the you know the artistry of, the, of these of these digital artists is amazing and that's great. But back then they were like they were very interested in keeping the the magic a little bit of a secret, not re- not showing their hand. You know keeping it close to the chest. You know keeping the those secrets and oh yeah did you did you did you read about how this was one of the first movies ever shown on a plane let me tell you about that they took a projector and put it toward the back of the plane and projected toward the front i don't know if they had any music accompaniment as is common with a lot of these silent films i don't know who knows if you get disrupted they'll be like do 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 it and you know that wouldn't be very pleasant i mean for a person who plays music themselves it probably wouldn't be pleasant to be playing you know, your music, and then you're like, eh, like when the airplane moves. Those planes are not very big, and then you've playing music on it, that would be insane. Now, the other insane thing that they said is is that the projection uh, machine or whatever for the film, it, it, it was it was very yeah, flammable. So they were like, it's possible that we could, uh, this plane could catch fire, film. and and it's like, Instead, uh, this thing's made fact, of wood. Uh, um, <laughs> so that was that was interesting. And, and of course, this uh, movie then. did did very well when it came out, and it's probably the director's most famous enduring work. I mean, they did, the director did other things after this. So it's like, where the previous stories of the 1920s, the previous movies set the story, this set another standard for what you could do with uh, effects and CGI, though not actually CGI. Well, stop motion became such an, an amazing part of, of, of Hollywood and even film all over the world that it became it became something very commonly used. I mean, it, it, it was used all the way up even into the 80s, 90s, Tim and Burton's today. Nightmare Before Christmas is entirely a uh, stop motion clay. Yes, it is. And, and and it actually was produced by Tim Burton, but it was actually directed by Henry Selick. That is actually a common mistake people use is because is, 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 it's very Burton-esque, you know, the designs. And plus it's called Tim Burton's and Nightmare. Exactly, Christmas. because they were using his name. And of course he, he would do all the, you know, you know, interviews. Yeah, they do everything CGI today, and that's why it's very interesting when someone still uses stop motion. I mean, uh, stop motion is in the in the movie in Return of the Jedi, you know, with with the Rancor um, that uses um, a lot of the people that worked on Star Wars and other things like that. Also, also, also Terminator. They use a method of of the stop motion called well, it's copyrighted called Go Motion. What they do is they they have a way of blurring the film where the the objects move regularly. Stop motion tends to be very stuttery. Have you noticed that? Yeah, and very uh, staccato. 
and they use this kind of blurring motion where when a creature or something is running towards the camera, they blur it slightly. You know, if you were to pause certain frames, you'd, you'd be able to pick it out. But I think it's more something that your eye, your mind just, just interpolates. But it, it's their way of adding just that little bit of reality to, to stop motion. But it's been used in tons of stuff. I think uh, I think we have Jason. Don't we have Jason and the Argonauts on our list? Yeah. Um, so to talk about, about Willis O'Brien, just for one moment. I know that they're actors and, and they're, <laughs> they're directors, and that's great. But honestly, the most enduring person out of this entire production is Willis O'Brien. We're going to see his work again in King Kong, Son of Kong, Mighty Joe Young, maybe. He really liked working with the apes. I don't think he worked on Valley of Guanji. It's possible that his Padawan, <laughs> his Padawan Ray Harryhausen, I think, worked on that. Yeah, just to let you know, Ray Harryhausen, which the name is synonymous with amazing stop motion. When someone hears that name and they're like a fan of classic film, they think of things like, is it Jack the Giant? Yeah, Jack the Giant Killer had some stop motion creatures in it. Clash of the Titans. Ray Harryhausen did a lot of stop motion. He studied underneath Willis O'Brien and kind of took the reins from him and, and had his blessing. And I think Ray Harryhausen and Willis O'Brien did work together on a film. I don't know which one they did. We'll get to it. This was Willis O'Brien's real deal. And honestly, I think that the dinosaurs in this look look good, but just wait till what he can do like four or five years from now with King Kong. When we get to King Kong this season, you're going to see him at his at his best. Some of the scenes in there are just, they, they're still great today. So much characterization, even characterization in some of these dinosaurs, especially I think some of the, you know, scenes with the brontosaurus, they give him some, you know, some kind of, they give some personality. I think a lot of the personality I I took was uh, the Al- the Allosaurus. I like the Allosaurus and how it gives that snarl, you know, and kind of you know curls his lip up, you know, a little bit like some prehistoric Elvis. It kind of gives a little personality to some of these creatures, but he does that a lot further on in his career. But you know, after all these creatures are amazing and well known, very popular, they were all there in like one million years ago, living their best life and stuff. Very popular among lots of little children. Yes, and I and I can I can relate to that because I was thinking about that earlier today. Is that you know when I was young, probably about twelve, thirteen, fourteen, I was insanely obsessed with dinosaurs. Anything prehistoric was just amazing to me. And I thinking about it, the one main reason I can think of that I love dinosaurs so much was here we have these these monsters. And they're creatures that seem almost mythical, and they don't even exist now, but they did. And we have, you know, fossil evidence of them, and so they did exist. And, you know, we can imagine what they might have been like, and we can kind of look at, you know, biological features. Uh, which, to talk about that, uh, did you notice that, you know, in, in other dinosaur movies you may have seen, their tails and their backs, you know, their tails are very limp. And they're, the di- dinosaurs are all kind of dragging them behind them. And they're standing kind of straight like a person would instead of more like down with their spine, you know, horizontal and their tail kind of going straight out. Which would, of course, be a lot more natural. It would. And, and the hunting would be a lot easier. And, and, and a lot of and some of the fossils we've seen that actually fits the, you know, the placement of the spine and where the muscles would attach so, and, and of course you see the, uh, but again, that comes with time. I mean, some of the stuff that, that the British people, even earlier to this time, uh, I guess in the 1900s uh, or in late 1800s, uh, thought, what they thought of dinosaurs was kind of weird. There's actually a, I think it's called Crystal Garden or something like that. It's in, it's in London still today, but it looks kind of abandoned. They had this iguanodon that, that doesn't look like an iguanodon at all. There actually is a kind of, uh, you know, an iguanodon is, is a kind of a, um, a plant-eating dinosaur, and this one w- was like on, on all fours, but he was like thick, you know, thickly set, like, and, and, and had a horn on his nose. If I show you a picture of this later, you'll see what I'm talking about, but... But of course, we're on audio, and we can't... Uh, we can't show, show you, you a picture, no. Yeah, just imagine uh, stuff. We'll read out some uh, binary... And then you'll, <laughs> you can piece it together in your you brain. Piece it together in your brain. The future technology zero zero one zero 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 one 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 zero zero one. Oh, that's a ama- that looks great. That looks awesome. That was I great. Love it. I love that frame. It's the best frame in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> the cool thing that we can do is things that we talk about now. After we get the episode up, we can remind ourselves to kind of post some pictures from the Crystal Garden um, to to kind of show what they thought of dinosaurs at the time. But that's just a side note. Um, 
but we but later as as more and more discoveries took place and, and we found more and more you know scientists found more and more dinosaurs um, they were able to kind of realize exactly how more so they moved and 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 what they uh, did and how they acted. What they might have. Yeah, this was just a, this was just a educated guess by Willis O'Brien, and he was probably, you know, doing it based upon what he thought dinosaurs of the time looked like. Because after all, there's a lot of things that uh, there's a lot of things that are just ed- uneducated uh, that are just educated guesses in this world, and uh, you know, hypotheses that have to be turned into theories. Exactly, exactly, and the thing the thing about this is. All they had was, you know, was bones and guesses, and Willis O'Brien was just doing his thing, and he was just animating how he thought that they might move, and uh, and honestly, he he put quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of personality, like I said, and movement in these creatures. So this film was very was very popular at the time. Uh, people were enamored at at, at the effects. Uh, they did not know how they did them. They said it was you know masterpiece uh, of the time. It was probably the most, like I said, the most well-known of the director's films that, that he did as far as what I, what I think about. Um, I think it was that Harry Hoyt who directed it. Uh, yeah. The production company that came up with the movie was First National Pictures. Um, they were they started out in 1919, um, kind of changed their name a couple times throughout, and they were purchased up by Warner Brothers later on. I think that they kept them on to do kind of what we'd call B, uh, B pictures. We're going to see quite a bit of those B pictures. Yeah, you know, the, the B movie. B, yeah, well, that's where they came up with the name B movie is because they'd have an A movie which would star the most famous actors of the day, the most famous directors. And then they'd have the B movie, which would be a director who was not that well known, but what would draw people to the movie would be the aliens or the UFOs or the monsters. Or B. Barry Benson. Or B. Barry Benson, exactly. <laughs> but the, <laughs> but the, the, the B-movies of yesteryear, they were called B-movies because of that, because they were, um, they were, they were not the big respectable quote-unquote movie. Though they started with B, of course. They're B-movies, but not B-I-G movies. Right. And then they were, uh, as, far as, I, as far as I can tell, a lot of the most memorable movies for me that are science fiction of the you know 30s 40s 50s were B movies. They're the ones that that where the special effects are kind of all over the place. They're they're kind of the most fun to me. And the, and a lot of those we we're gonna watch a lot of those. We're gonna watch some A pictures. You know some ones that were really meant to be taken a little more highbrow and taken seriously. And sometimes that worked out for the best, and sometimes it didn't. Um, but yeah, the the B pictures were kind of done you know more done by na- first Nas- national pictures For the but they did some man. other you know comedies and romances westerns and stuff like that but it got folded into Warner Brothers as they just started they kind of subsumed into them which is fine uh, you know production companies did that all the time but you really didn't really hear too much about what they did i didn't even know that they folded in so who can we talk about when we talk about the cast uh, so first of all we have the person who fear- appears in uh, not most prints, like, most of the prints is missing, but, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself, uh, appears at the very beginning of the film in, like, a little, uh, frontispiece is the fancy word, but, uh, like, he gives this kind of introduction to his, like, catchphrase or whatever. Not really his catchphrase, but, like, his dream. Okay, so, at the very beginning of the movie, he has a quote where he says, I have wrought my simple plan if I give one hour of joy to the boy who's half a man, or the man who's half a boy. Of course, uh, we do realize that women and girls like these kind of movies as well, but I think that the infamy of his, of his writing was, was that he was writing... Yes, but there's a, there's a childlike wonderment in a man that's still there that hasn't been You know, that's a quarter destroyed. of a man, because half a boy is therefore a quarter of a man. Half a boy is a quarter of a man. Yes, this is, uh, this is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's math, everyone. Uh, and it work it works out quite well. Um, so our next one is uh, we have uh, Paula White is played by Bessie Love. Yes, P- Paula White is uh, in the store. Yeah, love it. No, it's pronounced love. And here's the thing: that's actually not her real name. I think her real name was Juanita something. And the thing is, a lot of times actresses would change their name, you know, or have a professional name that they operate under. 
and that was so that they, uh, I, I mean, you know, Boris could be Car- more recognizable for yeah. uh, starhood because around this time, 1920s were developing stars, you know, people who were famous, and so like you wanted them to be names that everyone can know. Like, what is like better than the word Beyonce? So like, <laughs> uh, Beyonce <laughs> took the name Beyonce, and it wasn't her original name, but uh, she took it to be recognizable. At least I, th- as far I thought as her. I, know, I thought I her. Nothing. I thought her original name was Beyonce. I don't even know. I don't even know. Yeah, a lot. Of, I do know that Lady Gaga's name was not her birth name. Is not Lady Gaga. So, <laughs> I am sure of that. Okay, so don't quote us on that. But quote me yeah, on that. She, she wasn't. Uh, she wasn't chosen her name because of uh, her first word being Gaga. No. No, I think her real name is Stephanie Germanata. Um, but she is. She's Italian. But the thing is, I think she got her name from the Queen song, late Radio Gaga. All right, so anyway, back to this. Bessie Love was an actress, and she had some, she had some, you know, after this picture, she did some musical pictures and got kind of known for that. But her star kind of started fading in Hollywood about the 30s. And so she kind of, she had a, had a baby, settled down a little bit. Um, I think that she started working again as an actress. or She, she almost, almost like she retired early. No, I'm mistaken. But she started working again in the 40s with these movies that were musicals. And they were using some of her old footage. I think. Then, then, then she used that notoriety to do some more work. I don't think that, that she did much more than that, but she has a very expressive face, and, and it's nice. She uh, She's a good leading lady, uh, as far as this is, story is concerned. So she plays Paula White, who is the... She's the daughter of the famed, famed explorer Maple White, which is fantastic. And he gets... He got... But, uh, he found the, the Lost though. World in the Mesa. So about Glass. This, but eventually died there. Y- well, that's what we'll discover. That's all I can say about Bessie Love. Uh, next is Lewis Stone, who, uh, what can you tell us about him, other than he was uh, playing Sir John uh, Roxington, who is the, uh, who is another contender for the love of... Uh... Uh, Paula, is he really a contender for her, for the love, or does he just care for her? Like, almost like, it's almost like a father, almost get a fatherly kind of vibe from him. Do you, do you, are you saying that he, do you think maybe that he liked her like that? Well, he did look kind of sad toward the end of the movie. Enough about the the plot uh, till later. But he did look kind of sad on one part. So, you know, I think, you know, and they don't really spell it out. But I thought that a lot of it was a fatherly thing. He was even happy that Edward kind of ends up with her. He kind of, Edward Malone. But he, he, he ends up with her and he's actually okay with it. But he just, he seems kind of down and dour toward the end of the movie. I think maybe because... Well, Gladys, so Gladys, we'll talk about her, and I really don't like what she does to uh, to Edward. We'll, we'll, we'll go into that. So, Louis Stone, he was a film actor with Metro-Golden-Mayer, which was a later company that came out. He was a contract player, which meant that, like, remember how I said that there were certain actors that would sign up with a production company and pretty much be in a bunch of movies for them? He was, he played, the, he's best known for playing Judge James Hardy in the Andy Hardy film series. I'm not very familiar with that, but it was probably pretty uh, popular enough. Um, he did get nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor in 1929, which was not like four years from this. So, okay, good, good going, buddy. Okay, so who are our next uh, few important people real quickly? Uh, of course, we have Wallace Beery as a oh, challenge. Oh, yes. Wallace Beery we can definitely talk about. Okay, Wallace Beery, I was looking at his face and, 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 and wondering where I've seen him before. And I've seen him in a, I think it was a 1930s edition of, or a, uh, a 1930s version of Treasure Island. He played uh, Long John Silver. And I think Jackie Cooper, a young child actor, played Jim Hawkins. So, yeah, he was in that. And, he, of course, he didn't, he didn't have the beard. And so that's why I didn't remember his face. Now, Wallace Beery, uh, he's, he's a kind of interesting character. I mean, if you, I, there's a story that uh, the famous science fiction author Ray Bradbury, when he, was, when, was, when he was a little kid, came up to Wallace Beery trying to get an autograph. And Wallace Beery cursed at him and spit at him. So I don't know. He he doesn't see uh, a lot of people would kind of say he's a prickly character. 
He also... As prickly as Professor Challenger was, so he was obviously perfect for the role. That's what I was thinking, too. The other thing is that there is, unfortunately, he did have a, I don't know if it was an affair or something with a a lady, resulted in kind of a scandal because the woman was going to have a child and he was trying to make an agreement with her that she would not name the child anything to do with him, wouldn't use his last name or anything. And there was a whole, you know, uh, a pater- what's called a paternity scandal. Like, whose baby is this baby? Is it Wallace Beery's? It was a whole thing. What child is this? What child is this? <laughs> is it Wallace Beery's? But ended up, it was his kid, but it did change law at the time. Because at the time, you know, you couldn't just say, hey, you can do this and you can't do that. You had to actually, you know, have things written down. You had to have agreements or else it just, it wasn't allowed. You can't just have a, can't have what's called a gentleman's agreement. You can't just shake hands on it and, and, you know, and you have to do it. In this case, this is, it would deal with children. You have to treat it a whole another different way. Unfortunately, that's where he kind of was, was famous for. But Wallace Beery was, was also famous for a series that he did call, uh, I think it was called Men and M I N, uh, Men and something. I don't know what it was. It was the, it was it, him and this other actress who, uh, they were very like, you know, kind of married characters and they would kind of go back and forth making fun of each other and, and giving each other a hard time. And then people thought that was funny. So that he did, he did a handful of movies with that. Uh, but that's, that's all I can really say about him. Um, I don't think we're going to see uh, any of his other films as far as, as far as what he did because he didn't do too many science fiction, fantasy, or horror. So, And so uh, quickly, our next characters are, you know, uh, Arthur Hoyt is uh, Summerlee, Professor Summerlee. Arthur Hoyt is actually, the he had, he had a nice career, but he was the brother of the director, Harry Hoyt. So that's, he was, I don't know if it was just kind of done as a favor, maybe? Yeah, maybe. And so we have uh, Alma Bennett is uh, Gladys Hungerford, who is the... Uh, the first person that we see in this movie as we go into it but we're not there. It is and there's and there's not much to say about about her career. She had a decent career. I think a lot of the people in this uh, in this list of actors had a had a good career. Um next we have uh, as the ape man uh, we have Bull Montana. The only comment that I can make on this is that Bull Montana is not his real name. I think it was a Alteration of Montagna, which is a different spelling. It's a, uh, I think, either Spanish or Italian. But he plays the character of Gomez, and he plays the ape man, which I thought the... He was our suit person for it. Yeah, but did, what did you like about the suit? I thought it looked it really realistic. Cool. Uh, there could have been, like, more shading on the ape man and, you know, their mysterious chimpanzee uh, leader, which was very funny. When I saw that, I was like, who is this chimpanzee doing here? And I was like, oh, it's the leader. And I'm like, what? That chimp is great. <laughs> that uh, chimp is awesome. Lots of good monkeys. And there's, a, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's two monkeys mainly. There's the little, the little chimpanzee and there is a capuchin monkey, Jocko, which Jocko... He's the good character. Jocko steals the show and most every other scene that he's in. And then next we have uh, Jules Towels as Zombo. You want to talk about Zombo? I want to mention one thing about Bull Montana real quick. The reason his name is Bull Montana is because he was a wrestler. Makes sense. Yes, awesome. All right, so, yeah, Jules Cowles had a lot of roles. I don't know if he did any other roles like this, and I'll tell you, we got to talk about this real quick. Why, oh, why couldn't people not be racist and just hire an African-American gentleman to play this character? Yeah, instead they hired a British person. I mean, they try their best, but it's obviously a British person. You know, it's the same fa- It's the facial structure that is common among a certain type of man, which is uh, in Britain, if I do say so myself. And, and, he's, and he's, he's in bla- what, we, what we would call blackface. He's co- covered, his entire face is covered in, in a, a brown or black paint. And otherwise, he's like completely British. He doesn't look a thing like it. Yes, and unfortunately, uh, and problematically, when you read the text in in the little text uh, portions, he it's actually written very, uh, very prejudicial, very stereotypically. This stereotypical patois way of speaking of someone who is an African American or black person at the time. He's like, we's gonna goes to the places and stuff. Oh, it's it's so bad. Now here here's the thing. We're probably gonna see some of those again. This is something that 
was a problem with Hollywood. I think that and would probably appear for a couple more times to come. Yes, and and honestly, you know, it can't be gone soon enough for me. Of all the things that happen, yeah, you're, you kind of roll your eyes at them. We are going to see them a little bit. I'd say a couple of things that we'll see. We do see some actual what we call black people, African American people playing parts. I think in King Kong as the natives there and a lot of these movies when they you know when they portray natives they're like okay we're we're showing you know modern civilized white people and they're going into this uncivilized savage area and then you know they get but at least at least these were actual black people given a job i i i just this blackface thing can't go away it it can it can go away. It can go fly. Yeah, high. but we only mention it because it's important, and we would not really mention it otherwise because it's like – because if it wasn't there and you actually had people who were in those roles correctly, then uh, that'd be amazing. Uh, but yeah, it would be. mention to this. Yeah, and it's, it's unfortunate we have to mention it, but – you know, I didn't, you know, the first time I saw this movie, I didn't think about it. Maybe I didn't pay attention. I think as I grow older, I look at each one of the different actors and go and think about them and wonder, you know, why did they take this role? Oh, and then there's this guy. Oh, that, that guy's not a real black person. That is just a guy they painted uh, brown. Yeah, so that's all of our actors that we have. Here. Yeah, well, there's there's other actors that are, there's, of course, Jocko the monkey as himself and Mary the chimpanzee as herself and that kind of, but those are the only actors that we can really most other actors in this, like Mrs. Challenger, she has a couple comedic lines at the beginning, but um, not too much that can be said about you know some of the secondary players. You know the the main ones that I can think of would be uh, Sir John Roxton, the Challenger, Edward Malone, the journalist, and Bessie Love. I think those are mainly the characters that you see most of the action from, and of course from the dinosaurs. So uh, in a little bit, we'll hop into the plot. Uh, if you don't have any more things that you'd like to say about any other things i do have one thing we can talk about but if you want to we can talk about another version of this movie that came out in 1960 Uh, if you want to we could uh i'll tell you what after after we talk about the plot remind me uh after we get to the end of talking about the plot of the movie we can talk about what this remake of it's a remake of this movie and of course a portrayal of lost world by conan arthur sir arthur conan doyle it was made in 1960 there's some interesting things to say about it and some unfortunate things to say about it but it's interesting nonetheless and it bears it bears talking about so with that shall we leave you and come again <laughs> So, uh, we've returned from the, uh, the Amazon jungle, uh, the lost world. We went there to, uh, find out the plot of this movie because we couldn't figure it out for ourselves. But, unfortunately, uh, I got bitten by a previously thought to be extinct, uh, species of snakes. So, uh, if I manage to exist still, then that's completely fine. I might just die in the middle of recording. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> We've got to get you some oh, no. some anti venom or something. Well, I mean, yeah, we can get it uh, in the hospital. So uh, we're gonna talk about the plot of this absolutely wonderful. We're gonna break uh, it down. Movie. Break it down. Break it. Break One it down. One thing that I can say is that there were a lot of adaptations of the Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Of course, there's the book. That's the main source for everything. There's the one we're doing, and then there's the 1960 version. Oh, my goodness. Version. There's a 1960. There's a, a, even a TV show that came out in 1999. There's a lot of adaptations of it. There, there's been TV movies made of it. The fact that it's open you know, open domain, open source, they, people take advantage of that. That's why there's so many Sherlock Holmes movies and things as well. Because he's also a popular character, although, of course, as we discussed, uh, not the favorite, but... Professor Challenger is yeah, uh, which which Arthur doesn't Sunday make a lot of it. sense because as we'll find, Professor Challenger is kind of prickly. I mean, as his personality. Yeah. So the uh, movie it begins, of course, with the frontispiece piece that we discussed earlier of a uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and his dog. Are he's saying his catchphrase of like the uh, half a man and half a boy and stuff. So then after that, we get our first scene of the movie, which uh, jumps straight into it, which is uh, model toy boats. There's a city in the background with Big Ben. Now tell me, 
where on earth are we, guys? It's totally not extremely obvious where we are. Like, how, where on earth can we be? Is this Columbia? We're in London. <laughs> it's totally not London, guys. It's to- the first thing we see is uh, Gladys Hungerford and her, I guess, current boyfriend, uh, Edward Malone. They're talking. He is probably going to propose to her and... She's like, no, I don't want any of your stuff. She wants someone who's faced death and danger yes. and strife and stuff, which I don't know any woman who would specifically want that out of a man, but uh, I guess she it likes makes a sense bad boy, I guess. You know, some ladies like the bad boy, and she doesn't think that Edward's bad enough. So, Edward Malone is played by Lloyd Hughes. I don't know a lot about him, but I do know he was in an adaptation of Moby Dick later in his career. It's a very great book, uh, Moby Dick. Ed Malone, I guess I'll call him Malone during this, but Malone kind of pushes her to say why she doesn't want to get married with him. And like you said, he says, Love I me. will only marry a man of great deeds and strange experiences, a man who can look death in the face without flinching. So then, uh, so then, of course, uh, we go to the London newspaper office. Where he works, of course. He's a That's where, uh, yeah. news reporter for this that's London where uh, Malone office. works. I think his boss's name is McArdle. I'm not sure. but McArdle, um, yes. Yeah. So we find out uh, from some exposition between discussions by these newspaper guys that Professor Challenger, he's threatening to sue the paper for doubting his story about live dinosaurs. And we see an article where it says that a famous zoologist returned from South America without any proof, but just with strange tales of mammoths, pterodactyls, prehistoric monsters in the upper reaches of the Amazon. It doesn't give the exact location where he discovered anything, and the photographs he does have... Yeah. At first I thought it was Africa, but now it's like South America, which it I is. didn't think. It's the Amazon. The photographs that supposedly photograph the, the dinosaurs, they're damaged because the canoe was overturned, and they cannot be accepted as evidence. And at the time, of course, they were like, if water c- contained anything with those Polaroid pictures and stuffs and that rollo uh that they have is gonna absolutely fry itself with wetness oh my goodness yeah yeah the film the film that they had back then was not amazing so but we still have a lot of photos from back then so maybe they did survive pretty well so uh we come and then the next part is that he's like there and the newspaper office guy he obviously thinks that uh challenger is of course not on his best foot here with his argument because they go to interview him and then he like literally demolishes them because (laughs) of his character. He's just like, he's gonna, he's so strong that he'll literally beat up anybody for no reason. Well, he nearly, no, he has reasons, but he nearly killed three reporters that were sent out to interview him. Yeah, but of course to Ed Malone, he wants to prove himself to Gladys since this is a dangerous assignment to go on this mission because you could die in the Lost World because, of course, dinosaurs can uh, crush you. So he's, like, going over and he's like, uh, I want to go and stuff. And then he's like, no. Well, like, McArdle, he's like, no. And so then he, like, spills his ink and then he, like, wipes it on his face he literally walks and then he slips on the same piece of paper. This, These are the first comedic moments that we've gotten in our podcast uh, list is the comedic moments where it's like he gets the ink and then he slips on them, which is very comedic. Very he funny. does. Uh, he does. It's kind of funny because Gladys says, I need somebody dangerous who, who can look death in the face. And then you get this guy who... Always slips on paper. And he slips stuff. on paper, rubs ink on his face. Yeah, he's a uh, he's a real Arnold Schwarzenegger action star. Really, this guy. Uh, his boss wants him to go over to the zoological hall and listen in on the on the lecture, but reporters are kept out, which doesn't make any sense because reporters could spread the word. So I didn't really understand that. Why he doesn't like report reporters all that much? I guess he gets just got a challenger has a specific hatred for reporters. Yeah. Also, another thing is that uh, this movie is fifteen minutes more than a uh, Nosferatu, so uh, movies are getting pro- longer progressively or even shorter sometimes. Yeah, and uh, and movies, you know, let's let's fast forward real quick in our minds uh, to the modern era of the twenty of the, uh, the later twentieth century. A lot of movies, especially you know, really quick fast moving action movies or comedies will sometimes be you know 90 minutes long so that you can 
you know, show multiple runs of that movie. And then if something's a little more epic, it might go to like two hours or even three hours now. So, but I mean, an hour and a half may have been long for movies back then, but it's kind of short for movies now. Yeah. And, uh, that's pretty cool. So of course we come upon the scene where they're at the, uh, the club. It's a zoological hall. It's like a museum. And so, like, everyone's piling in to go to this place where there's a big uh, British flag, which I wouldn't really put a British flag uh, anywhere, but it's like the patriotism is immense. I mean, if it was a law in our country that we had to put a British flag everywhere, that'd be pretty cringe. Well, that would be cringy, but people were still, at the time, very... The patriotism for for Britain was, was really at its height uh, during this time. I mean, you know, the queen and, and the king and everybody was just really all, all fired up for that. So Ed is waiting to get in there and he is standing next to a dinosaur skeleton. He sees a guy, his name is Sir John Roxton. He's pretty awesome. He's a famous hunter, explorer. He's there to check up on the story that Challenger has told. If you want to know what they look like, if you might want to visualize, I mean, Malone is very plain kind of leading man type, and Roxton's older, he's got gray hair, kind of balding. Also another difference from the book here is Roxton actually helped end slavery on the Amazon with uh, notches on his gun for the kills of the slavers uh, that he defeated. Not in the movie, though, sadly. Yeah, they could have easily put that in there. That would have been a cool little... I, I, I like that little detail, and they could have easily put that in in the discussion with Ed and and, and John Roxton here. So, so they're talking, and... Yeah, you know, they both think it's going to be interesting speech, but there are there because there are students there that are heckling the professor, and they have these little noisemaker spinning things. You know, I can just hear them in my head because I've heard what I've heard what they sound like. They're really annoying. Yeah, you know, like in church when you have like the uh, the sixth grade and below section, they're just all like playing with some toy, I guess. So there's like yeah, but these are these are grown these are grown men and women who are students, and they're not really going to hear him out. I mean, honestly. Yeah, and because he hates reporters, what he does is Roxton, he um, gives Malone uh, his pass because he's like, oh, I'll let you in with my pass. And this differs from the book because in the book, um, he actually puts on a disguise to be a, another student, of which is figured out instead of just by confession, uh, as we'll see immediately after the scene is uh, instead he, like, tests him with a scientific test of which uh, he fails. Of course, something that they could have easily done. Yeah, yeah, they, exactly. And that would have made it a little bit more, I think, a little bit more interesting. But honestly, it's good for what it is. Um, so, they're, okay, they're in there, and the f- the first guy we see is Professor Summerlee, and that's, uh, he is a, what's called as a coleopterist, which coleoptera is means beetles. So he's like a real big beetle fan. Uh, he's an insect, uh, uh, an insect um, yeah. scientist. He loves. Uh, I don't know any of the Beatles albums, but uh, imagine <laughs> one of them. Uh, yeah, imagine. He's a Beatles fan. <laughs> that's a yeah. I was just joking. That's uh that's um John uh John. One of the Beatles wrote a song called "Imagine" after he broke off from the Beatles. So I don't know. I, I when you said "imagine that," I was just like, "Yep, there's a joke somewhere in there." All right, so Professor Summerlee is played by Arthur Hoyt. Uh, he says there's no proof of his claims, but they're going to give. He's going to give him an honest. Yeah, everyone is believing that there could easily be dinosaurs, but of course, as we know, of course, there are dinosaurs. Yeah, if uh, yeah, if there weren't, there wouldn't be a movie. So at at first, we see Professor Challenger, and we see he's very striking. Yeah, do these... not mess with him because he's like. Absolutely, you know, he's got that hair and that beard. He's all, like, mean to everyone, and he's like, sit down and be quiet and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, he calls people spineless worms for not believing him. That's pretty harsh. He wants uh, volunteers for the journey. Uh, Summerly volunteers. Roxton has already volunteered. Malone, he volunteers. The professor asks him his, his occupation, and I guess he forgets to lie, and he says he's a reporter. Oh, he snaps. He, it, I'm telling you, I've never seen an old, older guy move as fast as he does. He l- launches himself off of the podium 
and runs him out of the place. I'm telling you. Yeah, that you. is why you pump yourself with testosterone, go to the gym, and get angry at woman. Oh my god, no, no, it's not even that. Worse than other people of other races, and worse than women, he hates reporters. I think, you know, it's like, you know, it's like that lady in that spam, uh, in the spam uh, comedy skit on Monty Python. She says, I hate spam. He hates reporters. He hates it as much as she hates spam. So, uh, he runs out there. I guess he gets tired from cha- from trying to chase Malone down. And he gets in a car and just heads home. But Malone hangs on the back of the car to get to his house. And so he goes through the window and stuff. But then he finds him and he wrestles him to the ground. Oh, d- Okay, when you say wrestle him to the ground, I think you're being kind with that. They roll. They do like somersault rolling around. When, you know, when when Malone sneaks in through the window, you forgot to mention that a police officer, constable, sees them, and he goes up to his front door to knock on the door, and they're already rolling around so hard that they hit the door, roll out the door, and hit the cop, and the cop's like, do you press charges? And he goes, uh, no. Now, what happens next is, uh, once they kind of, you know, chill out a little bit, uh, he brings him in there and sits him down. The, uh, you know, John Roxton comes in after a little bit, uh, his wife, uh, you know, and also, uh, Challenger's wife is there and, uh, she puts up with him. I guess she likes a challenge or, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was, that was terrible. No. Uh, so what happens is, uh, she says, you know, oh, you've just, a nice man comes over and you didn't, how many more nice men are you going to throw out the window? So it's just And like, then what he does next is surprising. So, uh. I mean, there's, like, other things that you could do to be violent toward your wife, but uh, putting your wife on top of a cabinet, just a random cabinet, is uh, very random, and honestly, that is, like, the oddest thing. I mean, who knows? They probably were skirting around other stuff that they could have done, but uh, that would not have been my first or third choice. Yeah, but he's, he's, I guess they're showing that he's, you know, really, really strong for, for a guy his type. I mean, the, in the book, they even talk about that he's, you know, got this barrel chest and he's just, you know, he's just like this burly guy. Okay, so he has Malone sit down and Roxton is walking in. Challenger shows Malone uh, the diary of, a, of an explorer named, uh, with a strange name, Maple White. Maple White's diary has drawings of dinosaurs Maple White's daughter comes in. She's a very, you know, lovely lady, very, very, very thin, small. But when we see her, instead of stuff like, you know, uh, Dergolem's iris effect, uh, we have camera focusing, which is, uh, this proves the camera's improved definitely between then and now. So, uh. Yeah, they actually use a different, I think they use a different camera because they, they use this kind of, uh, what, they, I think they take this kind of this, this, uh, this oil or jelly and they put it on, uh, around you know, the edges, and it makes things look very dreamy. Uh, this is an effect that people use a lot, even when they're doing parodies of old movies. They'll they'll use that kind of that uh, that dreamy kind of focus. Uh, maybe maybe it's a special lens. I don't know. I've, I've heard that they they put stuff on the actual lens, like like a petroleum or something. But uh, or they use a different a different lens. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, that's that's a good that's that's a good little thing to see. She was with her father, and uh, uh, Paula White was, uh, I'm sorry, Paula, yeah, Paula uh, White was her father's assistant, and she got like uh, jungle fever, like a jungle fever kind of thing uh, when her father went up to the plateau, and she got better, but her father never came back. The plateau, because you'll find out that this Lost World area is on this uh, area that's raised off of the the ground. But it's very thin, though, so I don't really know how you could... Uh, explore so much. Well, part of it is the, the the part that they can get on. If you think of it like a giant, like a mesa, and they cover that mesa with jungle, and that's that's where the yeah. lost world is. Usually, it would be like underground. Usually, in most like portrayals and books of it, but uh, in this, it's elevated instead. Yeah, it was it was portrayed underground in, I think it wasn't it Jules Verne. Jules Verne's uh, trip to the center of the earth. Um, yeah, it was underground there. It was almost like in a, in a, in a, a hollow inner world, I think in that. And also stuff like, uh, Ice Age also had a underground dinosaur world, uh, that movie. Blue Sky Studios, R.I.P. Oh, really? Did they, did they stop making movies? Uh, I think so, but then they got absorbed into Disney, uh, this year, I'm pretty sure. Did they? 
Okay, that's yeah. that's that's very strange. I guess that means that. Uh, oh, is that because uh, uh, probably Fox? Yeah. Did Fox absorb him, and then Disney bought it? Fox. Okay. Okay. So um, in the diary that that they look at, um, they see more pictures of like Allosaurus, Brontosaurus. Um, Paula says that the native people that were bearing their equipment were very scared, and they wouldn't go any further and ran away. We still have people that are superstitious and won't go any further, right? Didn't they do that in Nosferatu? So uh, Malone says, oh, this could be a great human interest story. You see, if the paper doesn't get convinced of the scientific accuracy of the statements... They'll they get might... interested in uh, Maple White or uh, Dr. Challenger. Yeah, well, they'll do it as a rescue party. They'll go, oh, that... You know, the, the, they'll go for the rescue part of the human interest part of it. You know, we, we're saving people. That's what their that's what their uh, their their deal will be. So uh, I think that I think that Roxon knows Paula uh, or or knows her father, I think, or knew her father. I wonder if that's true, because he says, you know why I'm going on this trip. I know that you may theorize that there that he loves her, but I think he loves her a different way than then I think Ed might. Okay, so then we skip to them going to, to South America, and they do it like Indiana Jones style with a yeah, map. Yeah, because it's like Indiana Jones was like, people see that as the first instance of map traveling scenes. Oh, no. But uh, no, this was 56 years before, and they did this, which was probably very great, and also was the first. It would not be the last either. They did this. They did this effect in a lot of stuff in the nineteen thirties, forties, fifties. Parodies, uh, yeah, even parodies. All right, so um, so then we skip to they're in South America and it's kind of just uh, they're just on on the river. Uh, Malone's typing up a little story. Uh, they're he, uh, in the houses of some of the natives here, yeah. which varies from the book. In the book, they had to deal with uh, angry natives. But uh, in this one, they just don't. Also, another thing is that in uh, Latin America, uh, everywhere there, they have this green tinting, at least our restoration, but a uh, green tinting for the uh, the growth of the green, the bamboo, uh, like plants and the trees and stuff are all green. So it's either limitation and they couldn't make just those green, so they had to make the whole thing green. But it uh, makes atmosphere anyway. Yeah, it does. I, w- I would agree. And then next there's a crocodile. Yeah, we see him for like half a second, which is kind of cool. I, it's, it's probably a model or something. But okay, so they uh, are about ready to go, but they have a monkey there. And this monkey... He's playing with the glasses, and he's there. He's Jocko the monkey. And Jocko. he was brought there because of because he would detect all the poison and stuff because, of course, of their innate instincts for what and what wasn't. Uh, good food to eat. Yeah, but he also, he actually comes in in the clutch later on, as we'll see. I mean, you know, uh, of anybody, I think Jocko kind of saves the day. But okay. All right. So they're going down the river and we see uh, stock footage. You know, stock footage is like, you know, uh, scientifically filmed elements. So they're like all across there. There's like a snake up above. There's a jaguar or a tiger. There's a deer too, but there's a tiger there, and he's panting. He's not oh, it's just. A, it's, like, a, it's a. You're right. It's a jaguar. You're right. Yeah, he's not like. Uh, like they could have just had him standing there menacingly, but instead having him pant is realistic. Because yeah, he's yeah. Actually living, and he gets tired, and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and and stock footage. You know, honestly, uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of different uh, older movies will use stock footage because. They can get get it uh, at a cheap price, and it's a lot easier than actually hiring somebody to bring in animals themselves. All right. So, and the fu- the funny thing is, the cutest animal in the world, a sloth, freaks out Paula, and John Roxon's like, "That's no big deal. It's a sloth." I just it's like sloths are cute. I don't know why she's freaked out by it. I don't know. All right, so they are they are finally to the to the area just below the plateau. Uh, they're they're looking out. You know, when I look at that little the little plateau on the right, the little thin part, I can't help but think of one thing, and that's the house with the balloons from up. Yeah, I do agree. Does that make sense? Yeah. I wonder if there's some you know some possible you know homage and nods to that because a lot of these guys these guys that do these animated things they. They're big fans of older movies. They do. They put a lot of those stuff in there. And plus, you know, they have like 
the man with his army of dogs and stuff, the the villain, spoilers. Um, Absolutely. Who's uh, there. It's kind of like a lost world with, like, birds and stuff that it is yeah particular bird who's a uh, very interesting oh, absolutely. so um we're they're on the plateau yes and uh as we get closer to the, the plateau situation uh we do see something or someone, as they're camping out yeah we see a ape looking man and he is like interesting i think the 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 costuming is interesting it's, and the ape man just kind of just watches, and he's got this other chimpanzee that he hangs out with. Who's the uh, leader of him, I guess. Is he is really funny. the leader, or is he just ha- he just hangs out with him? Yeah, and so then there's a box of assorted goods as well, in which uh, two uh, baby spectacle bears are uh, eating from it. It's got yeah. all sorts of stuff, as you can see on the box, because they couldn't convey it normally with all the food inside, what it was, so they had it yeah, on the box. Yeah, we've got... We've got cute animal stuff, but, you know, I'm thinking, bring on the dinosaurs. Where are they? So, well, we'll get there because when they climb up to the pinnacle, they uh, they chop a tree and drop it over. But there was another tree that was previously used but lost uh, by uh, Mr. White, Maple White over here. Oh, oh, right, right. He, d- he did the same thing. Although I don't know why I've picked the uh, tree to the farther side. I don't know. I I think that they're just saying this is the obstacle we have to get past to get over to the the main plateau. And so they get over it like very slowly but surely and like a uh, very scarily because it's probably really high up. Now they do uh they do are they are pointing up in the sky and they see animated pterodactyl, but it's really pteranodon if you want to get uh technical. The animation for this creature is kind of jerky and kind of jittery but the stop motion gets better as the movie goes on the pteranodon was eating a was eating a toxodon which is a very interesting dinosaur we can't really tell too much about it it just looks like this uh bulky thing that he's eating and so i'm like whatever all right so one thing i wanted to mention is is the two helpers uh that are staying back at the camp one of them is gomez or i think it's gomez is his name and then, uh, and the other guy is Zambo. And Zambo is a regular guy. He's the guy. blackface guy. He's a guy sadly. in blackface, sadly. And honestly, yeah, and honestly, he doesn't do too much. But, you know, he tries, he does, there's a couple comedic moments. But, again, that's just, that's just somebody trying to make, you know, somebody who's black or African American the butt of a joke. And that's not awesome. And then we also see... Uh, as well, is a uh, brontosaurus, or brachiosaurus, or just a generic sauropod. I don't know. It is a brontosaurus. Now, one thing that I want to mention is, at the time, they had found uh, the body, a sauropod-like body, and they had found a skull, and they called that brontosaurus. Well, later on, we found out that it was another sauropod and the skull of of a camarasaurus, which is another sauropod, and they mixed them together. So there really isn't a brontosaurus. Except, I think a couple years ago, they actually did realize that that actually is a species. So for the longest time, I thought brontosaurus was real. Then they came out and said, no, it's not. You know, It reminds me of the Pluto situation. They said Pluto wasn't a planet. It was a dwarf planet. I still think it's a planet, though. Yeah, you know what? I, I, swear I grew, That's the way I grew up. And they call it a planet. And it's, it's a good size to be a planet, and, you know, I don't want to take that away from Pluto. Now, that dinosaur does do something pretty crazy. It actually uh, takes the, the log and, and breaks it off, and, and now they cannot get back home. Brontosaurus are just extreme jerks. We don't even know why. It's not for any reason at all. Well, okay, and we do get some, uh, we do get some shots of the dinosaur on the plateau, and people down below looking at it, and it looks pretty good. Yeah, it's like the the people are so tiny that you realize the massive scale of yes, the dinosaurs. Yes, and that's that's good. That, that, and that it like kinda... mirrors Jurassic Park because, of course, as the first thing is a brontosaurus or generic sauropod. Brachiosaurus, yeah. The brachiosaurus it... was shown in Jurassic Park, which uh, that series will cover later. Uh, we'll cover it in My detail, turn. yeah. So, uh, but sauropods or brontosaurs uh, type creatures, they're they're pretty harmless unless it happens to to step on somebody. 
you know, in a stampede or something like that. But in this case, they they kind of give them a little bit. I don't know, a non you know, like there's parts where uh, they're menaced by meat eating dinosaurs and they kind of you know fight back against them a little bit. And I'm wondering, you know, that they. They have a theory that sauropods, with their tails, uh, held them more aloft off the ground, and so they could have used them as like a um, almost like a a really thick bat and like hit uh, hit them. But they, you don't see that too much in a lot of these movies. I, I think honestly, those are things that they probably figured out over time. So uh, they encounter the uh, brontosaurus, and then they're like, "How are we going to uh, kill them?" Uh, because and they just like. He's got his rifle and stuff. It's like enough to kill an elephant, and he's like, "It's, it's this is like a spitball or like shooting a pea." Right. How on earth are we gonna kill this dude? Okay. Uh, quick question: What do you think about Summerlee? He's poking actual lizards with a stick. Yeah. There's uh in this movie, uh, I personally own a bearded dragon, and uh, there's a scene. There's two lizards on a rock, or three. And uh, he's, like, poking at him, and he's holding his tail and dragging the tail upwards so that they're, like, flying. And, like, as an owner of a lizard, they literally act just like a bearded dragon, and they kind of look like one, too, though not much. I mean, lizards all pretty much act the same, I guess, then. But this hit me really hard because I was like, aww. But yeah. But that womanly, of course. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think your, I think your lizard papa self comes out. All right. So, uh, okay, Malone is talking to Paula, and he's trying to get romantic with her, and he says, what are you thinking about this lost world of ours? That's the title drop. They said the thing. Credits roll. They, they, they said the thing. Okay, so Paula still misses her dad, and uh, she's kind of sad because they set a fire, and she was thinking, well, maybe if we set the, that, that he might have seen that fire, and he'll come. He never does. Of course, the ape man is still checking everything out, He's just spying on everybody. And then they're like, because uh, it's the Lost World and they might not escape from the Lost World or ever come back, that uh, that they can love each other anyway, regardless of the previous relationship with Gladys that Edward Malone has. Oh, that sucks. All right, so um, now we do see some more dino- you know, we If you want dinosaur action, you're going to get it. We get uh, a duck-billed dinosaur, a, a trachodont, uh, he's chewing on some brush next to the river. The Allosaurus fights him, grabs him by the neck, takes him out. Uh, now, w- one thing I noticed is that the dinosaurs breathe. Uh, this is an attention to detail that Willis O'Brien has. You will definitely see it when we see him again in King Kong, uh, Mighty Joe Young, Son of Kong. When he does dinosaurs or any animal creatures, he makes their chests rise and fall with breath. And that gives it this this life to it. Um also, the Allosaurus, of course, as I previously warned, uh, eats the other dinosaur, and like all sorts of battles, of course, in this movie where they eat uh, each other, and there's like saliva coming out of his mouth, and then that looks awesome. And then there's like uh, when he's eating them, there's like there's like wet bits out of it. So of course, that's why I said. It's not anything serious, of course, but it's like could kind of gross you out, like the spittles of saliva, which are very interesting, make it very scary and stuff. I, I think it's black and white, so I don't think there's too much of an issue. I'll, I'll, and also, the thing that I would like to point out is that animals, when they're meat eaters, will generally go hunt when they're hungry. They'll kill and they'll eat, and then when they're full, they won't really hunt anymore. So it's kind of that's. The, the, that's why there are a lot of plant eating animals is because a couple I mean one one or two animals will fall and the rest of them will get away uh, if the dinos, if the meat eating dinosaurs in reality acted like they did in this movie we wouldn't have anything because yeah. after uh, eating this other dinosaur he then goes over to a triceratops sorry yes a doceratops because there is no try according to Master Yoda. Uh, oh, no. That's a ter- All right, guys. You, we said, we promised you in the beginning there'd be dad jokes and bad jokes, and that was a, that was a, a good bad one? I okay. guess. Uh, and then after uh, the Triceratops fights the Allosaurus off, the crew comes out to it, and then they're like, they see something in the bush uh, at night uh, while they're camping. 
and there's glowing eyes in the dark, and they're like, what could it be? The Allosaurus comes out. It's extremely dramatic and so amazing. That's cool. a good. That's a good shot. Speaking of shots, they take a couple shots at him, and they throw a torch. This is a, this is really a famous shot. They throw a torch, and it catches it in its mouth. So you and then it a- zooms out. Also, another thing is that when zooming out f- for the uh, shot when he throws it in the mouth with the dinosaur, it is uh, r- really big for number one, and number two, it's a it is a cigarette. In fact, a full blown wow. cigarette. So that's why it's, like, incredibly big. And there's, like, what else of a stick object could you use? And it was obviously not to scale because a cigarette compared to a tiny dinosaur miniature. Well, see, now we know it killed the dinosaurs, and it was lung cancer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the thing is, you get a lot of dinosaur fights in this. Uh, they may not have a lot of rhyme or reason. I think they just were like, this is amazing. And a bunch of people were just like, wow. Um, now, here's the thing. The models and the animation, as far as the way they look, they look more realistic and they start moving a lot better the they're further... They're getting better and better and better. And then they're like, because of these experimentations that they've been doing and refinements of the movie culture. Absolutely. To cut long stories short, uh, all the dinosaurs are fighting and beating themselves up, all sorts. Of course, that's all happening and they're like, ooh, ah, uh, interesting. It, it only really affected them when the Allosaurus came through and they threw a cigarette in his mouth. Uh, the expedition group is getting brush or kindling for the fire, and Malone is climbing up the tree. He's channeling his inner monkey. He's cha- Yeah, speaking of monkey, he does not see the ape man who's following him. They all see him, and they're like, they're looking at like, oh, Ed, yeah, and he can't hear him. Because he's so high up and stuff, and then he encounters him, and then it's like, Bruh. if there were, uh, if there would be a stinger, definitely if there was music originally for this probably yes that'd be awesome and then the the ape man bull montana uh is the actor they shoot him and he just falls right so it's really anticlimactic because he's you think he's gonna do something awesome have like a fight and he just shoot him in the arm and he falls down yeah no it would probably have been like some sort of street fighter fight just transition to street fighter and stuff but then instead is just anticlimactic he looks like blanca doesn't he look like blanca a little bit like with the teeth and everything it's just <laughs> except blanca's yellow anyway maybe Okay, and then so, so we cut to dinosaurs eating more dinosaurs and then dinosaurs eating more dinosaurs. You know, there's a T-Rex and he eats the Triceratops and then the Pteranodon comes. And, and he just jumps up and eats him. eats it. And then, like, they're just, like, I don't know. They just really hate each other and they're, like, competing for absolutely no reason. Like, I, they didn't even do anything to each other. They just existed. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they just, they know that they are plant eaters they're vegetarians and they're they're really you know hardcore into into meat and steak and stuff and so they're just there's just this right in real life they would definitely be full by now because of eating their all their dinosaurs and stuff yeah they would leave them alone and i think uh actually in actuality uh some of those elements that we talked about the re- the realism of of dinosaurs of what we might think dinosaurs would be like that comes out in the Jurassic Park series. I remember a scene in uh, the the Lost World Jurassic Park two. Um, there's a scene where a guy who's an expert on animals in Africa he says that you know that the T Rex just fed. It's not going to hunt them anymore, and they're like. Uh, it just fed on our friend, and he goes, better him than us or something like that. And they're like, man, this guy's cold. Yeah. So, so they are in. They take shelter again in a cave, and so they're making a, a catapult a challenger in a summer league. And so they're like, uh, what kind of arc is this going to make? Challenger's <laughs> like, it's an arc. And then summer league's like, no, it's a parabola. And then he accidentally launches summer league into the river, which is pretty funny. This is a very comedic movie. Slapstick. Ha ha. Yeah, we get it. Yeah, they're like, you know, if this, uh, <laughs> if this had uh, any kind of sound, it'd be. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Roxton has ventured deep into the crevices of one of the caves, and so he goes and he finds a pile of some sort of uh, wet thing that's probably been drowned. And it's clothes and like a watch. It bones. There's a skeleton. And there's a locket that opens up and has the picture of uh, Paula. 
And so he brings it to her. The locket has MW on it for Maple White. It's Maple White's, absolutely. And then he's probably going to have extremely terrible news for uh, Mrs. Paula. And so then Roxton, he shoots his gun to get uh, Gonzo. Uh, Gomez. Or Gomez. uh, And Zombo's attention for some reason. Right now he's he's I think he's trying to get the, get their attention because they're stuck. And so then they're gonna take the hammocks, uh, break those down, and make a rope and stuff. And uh, they're like, "Well, how are you gonna get it up to the this other part of the caves upwards?" Uh, instead, uh, it is Jocko the monkey who will climb up and deliver the rope. Yeah, he supposedly he loves Paula so much that he'll do anything to get to her, and uh, you know because they're like trapped in this cave. Well, apparently. you know, hey, you know, uh, I don't know that maybe maybe they're, they're, they they can see the future. There there will one day be another movie about a monkey that really loves this girl and wants to climb up to a tall tower with her. But again, we'll have to uh, wait to we'll have to wait a couple of movies to get to that. I think I and then of course uh, in this the cave they're like uh, we're in the lost world we're uh, free from the world and the obligations of it. It's fine if I uh, cheat on uh, my former girlfriend and uh, they kiss. They're not married, so it is it. It's kind of just cheating. It is cheat. It is cheating because they're boyfriend girlfriend, I guess. And then they're like, we're gonna marry. It's they're, skeezy. It's kind of skeezy. Yeah, and then they say that they're going to marry uh, with uh, Professor Summerlee, who is uh, also a minister as well, and uh, is officiated to uh, do weddings. Um, and so then uh, Roxton goes and tells Malone to uh, find the professors, and then because he has to tell Paula about uh, her father being dead. and uh, Oh, man. They're go- they've gone back to the Brontosaurus and are observing the Brontosaurus, and uh, then the T Rex comes to the Brontosaurus again. Yeah, yeah, and there's a, this, it's a, it's a really good scene. The Brontosaurus even fights back against the Allosaurus, um, almost as as if he's another meat eater. It just the kind of the you know they I don't know I don't know the way that they make the the Brontosaurus fight is as if it's you know, fighting for its life and, and, and its teeth, you know, the teeth are, the teeth of a brontosaurus are supposed to be able to tear and crush, um, grass. And it just, it who just knows, seems... maybe meat is, as, uh, maybe meat is as soft as grass to the brontosaurus. Oh, wow. So then they have another battle, uh, and then eventually he falls into a ditch, the, uh, brontosaurus. He falls off the plateau into, into a, a river, muddy that, a muddy river. Yeah. And, uh, okay, now while that's happening and he's he's trapped there... It's very pitiful that you see him in that condition. Yeah, and but... so then he, there's a volcano that is going to erupt somewhere. I don't know. We don't get a good look at anywhere it could it's be. It's supposed to cover the whole plateau in, in lava. Because you see the, the volcano up at the top uh, on on the plateau. It, if, it, if it erupts, it's going to co- uh, cover the entire plateau in lava. And, and so then it's erupting and there's, like... A uh, harsh volcanic red tint, at least in our version, uh, c- contrasting the green of before. And dinosaurs are hoofing it. I mean, they are all running. Uh, there's even an Allosaurus who jumps on a sauropod's back as it's trying to leave. And it's like, dude. Because he, he's like, <laughs> I'm going to have a travel meal. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to uh, I'm gonna catch this sauropod to go. This is my door, uh, door dash. All right, so... Uh, now, while this is all going on, Jocko the monkey comes, like I said, comes in in the clutch. He gets the ham, uh, hammock ladder to, to Roxton and Paula. It takes him quite a while, though. All right, so as they're doing that, the ape, the ape man climbs up and grabs the hammock and starts pulling it up while Malone, everybody else is down except Malone's the last guy. I guess he's being, he's being nice. He let everybody go before him. So, and they're pulling it up, and, and then they... And somebody just takes out a rifle and shoots the ape man again. He, I, you know, I this is this is the kryptonite for the ape man is bullets. Yeah, like literally, you, you solve all your problems by shooting it 
But, however, I would not recommend doing that because uh, there's literally no reason to. It's not like you're getting points every time you shoot something, am I right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, those dumb video games. Those dumb half, video games. <laughs> those dumb Counter-Strikes. Yes, <laughs> like ex- absolutely. So, uh, a challenger, not one to not take an opportunity when it f- looks him in the face. He says, okay, we could take the Brontosaurus out of the mud, take it back to London... Oh, no. We see where this is going. As a proof. Like, the brontosaurus has already suffered so much trauma, and he's been stuck in the mud and, (laughs) quite literally, uh, at the bottom of the bucket, about to kick it, maybe. Probably not. But uh, he's already had enough trauma, and he's going to probably get revenge. He's going to get revenge, as we uh, see later. So the eruption has ended. Yeah. And uh, they're going back to London. Well, what they do is they is they meet uh, Major Hibbard. He's with the Geodetic Survey in Brazil. So he actually um, he's from he's from London, or, or it could be from London or America or something. And he's in in Brazil, and he says if we wait a couple months, uh, you know the the water will wash the uh, river out, and the uh, we can get the Brontosaurus out. So he'll him. be stuck for three or four months in the mud, and then they'll get him and put him on a boat. That's so much torture for this poor animal. I mean, this is has parallels to a, a trip to the moon where they bring back an alien. So this oh, is kind goodness. of an alien uh, to our world. Like, the lost world is kind of like a planet, uh, seemingly, in the midst of Earth. Yeah, in, in that one, though, we instantly enslave the alien. In this one, the the creature is more than we can handle. But uh, actually, in the movie, uh, while it is a brontosaurus, in the book, it's a pterodactyl or a pteranodon. Right. I think they, they, they made it a sauropod or a, a brontosaur uh, as an upgrade, but, you know, so you could see more destruction. Yeah, so uh, they go back to the Britain uh, into the uh, p- place at the, the end the of the mu- movie. Museum, uh, the zoological the museum, museum. The zoological museum. And then they go um, to... Uh, the people, and they're, like, all jeering at him, and it's like, where's your proof? And he's like, I got proof. It's coming in right now. Yeah, they've been away for a year, and they're finally like, where's your proof? And then uh, it comes stomping in on them in the streets because suddenly M- Edward Malone is uh, calling yeah. uh, Challenger, and on the phone he rings him up, and he goes, it's running amok in the city. Oh, no, it escaped. Yeah, but he tells he tells the people that it's that it's escaped, and they said, "Oh, great! You know, you're you're lying to us again." If they could just step out into the street, they would see the horror, and they chase him out. But when they go out there, they see it, and it, these the scene these scenes, I will tell you, you know, you can have some dinosaur scenes in the jungle, and that's fine. But when you bring it into our world with cars. And buildings and crushing things. Because this is like the size of a building. You know, it's going around doing its tail and whacking people. Yeah, for uh, real. Interacting with people, which must have been a challenge. It it still is for like CGI today. But like the compositing was so perfect that they could have it interact with humans. Yeah, and there's some really good shots in here. Uh, You know, it's animated awesomely. The The thing about it is... This was a, a, you know, a lot of the films that we've watched are, they get the I Did It First award. Uh, I mean, you know, when are we going to see uh, a giant reptile attack a city? Well, let's see. Uh, let me see if I can name some. And this is only a small list. Uh, the Giant Behemoth, uh, 20, not 20, yeah, well, this one has a, an alien reptilian creature. It's 20 million miles to Earth. Um, a creature from twenty thousand fathoms and uh, Godzilla and and Godzilla. How many movies are there of that? So uh, and of course Rodan is a Rodan is a giant pterodactyl. So there's your giant pterodactyl uh, attacking a city. But so, uh, so he's going over to London Bridge, and uh, one of the shots is he's passing by. There's a little goof, at least in the version that we saw. Okay. Because I can't guarantee this, but. If you can see this, there's one frame where the stop motion is going, and you can see the uh, the stand that is holding up the uh, the neck of the dinosaur for one frame. They accidentally forgot to took it out, which is extremely oh, funny. Oh, really? I didn't catch that. I didn't catch <laughs> uh, that. 
So good on you. But I mean, of course, frames for uh, because it's so jittery, you can obviously see that they're obviously going at a uh, like ten frames per second. I mean, if you know what I mean. Right. All right. So the I guess it's too heavy for the bridge. So he falls through the bridge into the the, the River Thames, which is uh, which is which goes through London. And, and then we have our final scene. They are with Ed Malone. There's Gladys, uh, but Gladys has a husband. Who already married because she was impatient. It was a year, and she Gladys was like, "Sucks." Yeah, and so she has a uh, Percy Potts as uh, her husband, uh, and then Ed is like, "Oh, I can marry Paula White then because uh, it's too late for me for Gladys How now convenient. that I've now that I've faced death and stuff. It was all worth for nothing." Well, he says he says well, he asks uh, Percy, "What you know? What uh, dangerous thing did you do to get her and be interested in you?" And he's like says, nothing. He was a cleric. Well, she says she says, "Oh, it was a girlish whim." Really? Ugh. Okay. So so uh, honestly, of all the women that are portrayed in film, Gladys is not doing women any favors uh, because she shows that her makes expectations of this man, and then changes her mind after he has gone and done it, just to, just to win her love. So, uh, we're, this is the, uh, we finished this movie. It was, yeah. uh, pretty great. Yeah, yeah, and the, and the thing is, uh, the, this film has been, uh, or the, or the, I say the book has been done multiple times, um, by different, uh, different groups. Uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about, um, uh, it's not necessary that we go into detail about it, but I just wanted you to to take a look. I am uh, for everybody uh, that's listening right now. I am actually sending William a message. I want him to see this little clip from a from the 1960 version of The Lost World. I'm going to see if I can't pull it up. So hold, please. Okay, you pulling it up? Yeah. As you can see in this scene they were watching, it's it's a di- it, the dinosaur battles in the old movie The Lost World were stop motion, but they could not afford to to do that. Uh, I think for the 1960 version, and they didn't instead have... they're alligators and lizards, and they have headdresses on, which is really funny. Totally dinosaurs. Yeah, but it's a it's a but the thing <laughs> bad is bad movies a, for you. Yeah, but it's a monitor lizard and a crocodile, and they're making them fight. These are two animals that would just be happy, living their best life. But some guy decided that he would that we would take these plastic or rubber pieces and glue them, glue them to their heads. Um, how are they going to get them off? Oh, they don't care because they're animals. They're just there to do what we want them to do. You see, there 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 are groups called the humane. Uh, they're humane groups that were created to uh, to care about um, you know uh, animals. That uh, you know that that were mis misused and you know, let's let's talk about west not not to go into detail but westerns uh, westerns a long time ago the, the horse horses by the dozens would die and they would just be like oh oh well you know and so they, eventually they were you see you know a lot of movies you see a message at the end that said uh, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie and, however and- obviously in this movie uh, not this movie but uh, the clip that we saw it's obviously they're harmed. I mean, yeah. there are people who dress up their dogs. That is also this probably is, on the this same is, level. This is worse. I would say this is worse because they're gluing these items to these creatures, and then you know, how are they going to? Do they care if these uh, these uh, rubber pieces ever come off of these creatures? They don't care. And and if you look at it, the crocodile is seriously biting into the flesh of this animal, and so there it could be it could have been seriously hurt. So, but they don't care because it looks cool to them. And honestly, it doesn't look as cool as as the stop motion. I honestly, stop motion and CGI looks better than using real animals. Um, I I will tell you though, William. There's a couple movies coming up that um, that use trained animals, and sometimes they kind of push them to do things that they're not supposed to do. Um, I think there's a movie called uh, the Gila Monster or the Giant Gila Monster. They kind of push this Gila Monster around just to get it to to run into things, which and is really sad. That is kind of sad, but it's I, it's I think this is worse. I think forcing two animals to fight to the death, you know, for your amusement is is pretty pretty low. So uh, I well, thought the movie was really great, 
and uh, the old one, right? The the, the nineteen twenty five version, right? Of course. So uh, the podcast is over, and uh, we have nothing else. It's to say. over. Well, okay. Let's end it with this. One more thing about uh, the Lost World. You know, you may watch this and go, you know, well, I've seen this a, th- a dozen times, but you've seen it a dozen times because this movie did it first. Um, you know, we're we're gonna see movies where. Uh, you know, where you have reptilian creatures, giant monsters, and they're and they're attacking people in cities, and and uh, and you see the the scale of the of the devastation. And this movie started it. It started it all. And uh, we want to give uh, you know, honor where honor is due, and, and and give a nice salute to the Lost World. Um, uh, 1925's The Lost World, and uh, you know we're gonna see we're gonna see the, a lot of the the. F- the familiar elements that were in this movie, we're going to see it done. Um, I, I would like to say, I, I, you know, you tell me what you think when we get to get to these movies, but I would say that, that King Kong does what this movie does, but does it way better. Um, yeah, it's, I it's one of my, it's one of my favorite movies uh, the original King Kong. So when we see that, you tell me if it's not way better when we get to it. So anyway, yeah. Uh, anything else you want to say? Nope. Okay, yeah, nothing more to say about about The Lost World. It was really good. The next movie that we're probably going to do is is a very uh, very dramatic uh, movie. Um, it is called um, Phantom the, of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera. It's not the musical version, but the musical version was based off of this story. This is the original story, probably with a, a little bit of changes for the screen, but. Um, yeah, but of course, uh, um, just get ready because I'm probably going to make some jokes about the musical. So no, uh, uh, you know, because my my wife's a big fan so of the music, so <laughs> de- I definitely know a little bit about so, it. So uh, that's that, and that's, uh, that. that's that. So uh, we'll see you uh, next week for another episode of our podcast. Absolutely. Goodbye. Bye. Don't forget to open your third eye telepathically message us at cinefanpod at gmail.com set your chronoscope dial to the future setting and peruse cinematicfanpodcast.wordpress.com hunker over your ham radio as your keen ears listen for the ghostly voices tweeting on our twitter at cinematicfanta1 exchange all of your money into republic credits and donate at our patreon page at patreon.com slash Cinefan Podcast. Ending transmission now.